We're helping to create jobs and stimulate Wisconsin's economy. So we're doing a press release about that. So part of this is likely to be used for that because you know it's it's yeah. you that's being stimulated. It's yeah. you that's being stimulated. Yeah. Well, and that's Wisconsin grown stuff. You know that there's a big push. Yeah. You know, for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now you've been farming for how long? Well, as soon as I get, I can't remember when I got home from kindergarten getting on the Ford tractor to drive when he picked melons. So oh. this is all I've ever done. So 10, 15 years, something. Oh, like yeah, that. yeah. Well, there, there you go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm 56. So. And how would you characterize your, your operation? Oh, it's, it's, we, that's all we know, and we think it's a lot of fun. You know, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. and that's the main thing. You got to have fun no matter what you do. But if somebody has never seen it before, well, how would you, how would you describe it? Well, with the farm market itself, we've got the petting zoo, and, the, and then we have a few attractions in the fall, and it, mm -hmm. uh, everybody that comes always comes back. Okay, so, okay. And then you know, our specialty is probably the fresh homegrown sweet corn and the melons and you know, squash and pumpkins. It's, there's a season for everything. Sure, you know, you know. sure, sure. Now, so how does that fit into what you're doing here with Mark? Well, I guess Mark was the one that called me, and. I really think this is a neat idea that Mark has with the, uh, you know, this, uh, well, I think last year he did some squash meals, and now this year with the squash house. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, I think it's a great, neat idea. Okay. And how does that affect your farm? Hopefully this will go big and we can grow more squash. The key to it is this, just find a market for it. Okay. You know, okay. And, that, and I think this is just another avenue that I hope goes well. So this is kind of something new for you. Oh. Very new, very okay. new, and I was really impressed with what he did last year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's got to work for everybody. You know. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, he, um, Dick does a lot of wholesale. Um, oh, okay. So, you know, the breadth of his business is um, field-grown vegetables. Um, there's a lot of yeah, wholesale. wholesale and retail. Right, exactly. Oh, okay. And so he has a place on Highway 14 a great place with a petting zoo. Mm -hmm. We get our Christmas tree there every year. And I oh. stop there like in three fact, times in the summer. I go in for a Christmas tree. I came one night and stole it and left my business card. See, I found you. Yeah, exactly. Oh. So I sell oil for the Christmas tree that's in my living room. So, I, so <laughs> that's how this whole thing, why you're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> We've got his see. fingerprints on. Ah, yeah. okay. 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 That's Everybody right. was home and I said, okay, let's do it. You've yeah. got the, the, the markets. Are there any other farmers that you're working with, or is there anything that you do to sell other products through what you're doing? Well, there's you know a couple of big uh, farmers about our size that if they run out of pumpkins, you know we trade oh, okay. back. And, you know if they if we're short of crop, we might buy some sweet corn if they're first before us. You know, so we do work back and forth. Okay. okay. But normally you want to sell your own first. Okay. Yeah. But nothing where you're actually taking it and value adding. No, nothing like Mark's doing. This okay. is a pretty neat, uh, right. and you've got to have the facilities to do this, Right. number one. Right, right. So it, uh, and if this works out well? I hope it does. Do you see this continuing, expanding? Well, we can hopefully raise the product if you can, mm -hmm. you know, sell the, the end product. Sure, sure, very good. How many acres do you farm now? We've got about 160 around the market. We oh, okay. But you know, some sweet corn, some, it's not all, we're diversified into a lot of different sure. crops. Sure. Now, are you from this area here? Yeah, we were born and raised. Ah. Well, okay. uh, my great grandpa settled in 1889. Oh, really? On a farm. Wow. So it's uh, been so here a few years. It's a lot of work. And, and you know, farmers, they don't, you know, they don't have a lot. You just hope you. Make enough money to carry over till next year. Right, <laughs> you know, right, we, right. We don't get rich, but we're we do what we want. If you don't sell this product, if if you hadn't been doing this, mm -hmm. what would happen to that product? Well, we've got some <laughs> area farmers that have hogs, and it just goes to the. You hate to waste it, but sure, it goes some hogs well, or hog some hog animals that, can, that right. can utilize it. You know. Yeah, yeah. But, okay. And you know, it, this farming thing. Very seldom do you have one guy call and wants the last box of squash and you've got one left. You either have bands left over or, or you mm -hmm. run short. Very okay. seldom. Ah. Do or, you know, is it ever right? Oh, that's fun? interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you, all depends what your yield is. You know, you might have some years where the bees, you have a hot dry summer, the bees don't get out and pollinate and nothing sets on. And 
Okay. You, you just don't have much fruit. But then some years you get you wonder what you're gonna do with it all. So generally it's either you have nothing left or Yeah, like you see very plenty. seldom does the guy come in and oh. want the last acorn you sure. got one left and it's perfect. <laughs> great, <laughs> no. great. And uh, the story for this year is that um, Dick and I had been in conversation about, you know, can I use a squash? You know, on Friday yeah. there were 27 bush bins left. Yeah. On Monday morning yeah. there were nine, yeah. or 15 yeah. or 17 or something like that. Yeah. Left. So it, uh, and you don't want to hold it. Then, you know, we don't have the real good storage facilities. Once we start fighting the freezing weather, right? Then, okay. That kind of determines when we're going to quit too. <laughs> sure, sure. So I called. Dick up and left a message on his cell phone on Monday. He was busy. He didn't answer. Called him up and said, you know, I can't use your squash. Sorry, I just haven't sold it. So an hour later, some guy knocks on the door and says, I'm confirming I can deliver squash from Dick Pack. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I just called and left him a message saying I can't use it. <laughs> uh, he said I'm kind of persistent. <laughs> He's persistent. No, no he's you're persistent. Yeah. Well, I guess how yeah. much? Well, how he much place, and it, it, the overnight load that night did look pretty cool. Okay. And I thought, boy, he had some storage facilities that made we kept it. Sure. So sure. within two hours, it went from I don't need any to nine big <laughs> yeah. squash sitting in the driveway. So, oh. Um, and it, and so that that's a that's a real benefit of scaling this infrastructure is because yeah. it would have frozen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it would have been worth nothing to him. It would have yeah. potentially cost him to go take it to a sure. pig. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Um, Excellent. And there's still no guarantee. I haven't sold it. He hasn't gotten yeah. the check yet. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's all on if it works, it works. If it doesn't, but, it you, but you're ending up with uh, what you feel is a marketable product. All indications are. All indications um, are. You know, there's this lag time of getting a product into distribution. Right. Um, but it's going way quicker in the food service than it ever did in the retail. Mm -hmm. And we'll have this out and available in the next three to four weeks. Okay. So we'll know. Okay. Um, and and this is really a feasibility study. Um, you know, mm -hmm. a physical three a phys feasibility study. And what are you doing with the product? Um, we are uh, cutting it in half, scooping the seeds out, cleaning that cavity. Okay. Uh, it comes to us washed, field washed or mm -hmm. washed. We give it another rinse, cut it, scoop it out. Um, give it another rinse with sanitizer in it and um, put it on sheet pans, bake it, and um, cool it down, freeze it, and box it. Wow. Put a label on it and then the fun starts. You gotta sell it. <laughs> now, <laughs> like Dick says, it means nothing if you don't have a, if you don't have a market. Right, right, yeah. exactly. And yeah. what do you have to do as far as how were you set up to do this? Did you have to reconfigure? Well, um, we set up last year to do it because of the market dinners, the frozen entrees. Ah, okay. Um, but one of the things that Renaissance Farm specializes in is how can we break into a new product given what we have? How can we actually create a, a test um, that will allow us to see whether or not we should be scaling? Um, if this works, it will look nothing, our process will look nothing like it did this year. Next year okay. will be completely different because what we're doing is not scalable if this takes. Ah, okay. Um, it's just purely too much work okay. the way we're doing it. So we have to automate and find sure. those kind of savings. But do you do that after you find out if there's a market? Market. market. So exactly. fairly low right. risk right. at this just point. Michael? Exactly. Okay. Very good. Anything else? Okay. Now this is new with you too then as far as yes. delivering the squash here mm -hmm. to Renaissance. Right. This okay. is the first year that we've. And how did you how did you guys get connected? Actually, we did some pumpkins this? last year and a little bit of squash. Right. Oh, okay. But more or less through the market, probably through the Madison market. Yeah, and absolutely. Stuff and contacts, other than. Right. And. Um, so how now? This is kind of interesting because you folks have just started doing your own value added. Mm -hmm. You know the the salsa and, right. and the tomato juice and all that. Right. Um, this is kind of a different, little bit of a different take on that, and that you're, you know, you're selling it out. Right. Um, how do you see this evolving? Hopefully, it'll evolve with Mark because it's a lot closer than going to Mendo Point to deliver our stuff. But sure. It, you know, it's a, it's a place that 
a different niche of what we grow, you know, mm -hmm. because a lot of the markets they concentrate on either just tomatoes or onions or whatever. We grow such a wide variety that it's nice to have a different place to be able to, to market it. Sure. Because not everybody, sure. and, and we're trying to do something with the company in Mineral Point, but it's not the same as what Mark's doing. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do our own um, pumpkin pie filling or pumpkin butter with them and, and mm -hmm. a squash, um, pesto, tomato sauce stuff that they could put on spaghetti or lasagna or whatever. So we're doing that type of thing, but it's completely different, okay. different uh, product. Than sure. Is doing. I mean, that is something that you're, you're, you're doing and, and selling under your name, yes, right? Yes, under our okay. name. Okay. And They're is, processing for us. And this is kind of spreading the network out a little right. bit. Um, it's just in farming in general, and you, you folks have been, tell me a little bit about how long you've been farming and how you ended up where We've you are. We've been farming since, well Gary was farming when we met. Okay. And then his brother and him farmed together and it was a matter of, you know, income source or whatever. So at that point his parents were at the point where they needed help at the farm, farm market arena. Okay. And so we talked to them and they said, you know, let's work together. and. So mm -hmm. that's when we started that, and that is 30 years ago. Okay. So we've been at the farm market up in Reno for 30 okay. years. And the, the farming business has changed in those 30 oh years? Oh my gosh, yes. It's evolved okay. so much. How um, so, would you, would you say? Um, a matter of people getting back to eating fresh foods. Fresh, okay. You know, they want their fresh produce. They want to see what's coming from. That's where the markets are really nice because people are, I'm buying from you. I know what I'm getting. Mm -hmm. You know, that, and that's what we're seeing with the tomato juice, you know, they can buy a can of tomato juice for 99 cents maybe in the store, but they're, they want to buy from the person that's pre growing the tomatoes and they see where it's coming from. Sure, sure. And so that's where we see it's evolved. Okay. You know, so. And then what about scaling up from there into kind of what you're talking about with Mark here? Well, that's another part of them being able to say it came from this market, you know, with our pictures or whatever, and it's going right to us, it's fresh to us, it's not going to Del Monte where it's processed and you don't know what they've done with it, mm -hmm. and, you know, you know how it's being handled, you can come right back to the source, mm -hmm. you know, and he's, he's buying from one or two farmers, so you can go right to those farmers even, you know, go right back down that 100 farmers growing for Del Monte Corporation. Okay. In the grand scheme of thing, I, things, I buy almost nothing from them compared to what they produce. So, you know, the six pellets that I bought from them this year mm -hmm. is not tapping their resources at all. So, But it's helping us, it, it helped us get rid of excess that we had at the time. It was a, a great, mm -hmm. um, it helped us tremendously because we, this year we had a tremendous amount of acorn squash. Ah, oh, okay. And none of the places, Malio or um, Heartland Produce, had a need for them, you know, all some produce. They, you know, no, we've got plenty. We need okay. butternut. We didn't have a lot of butternut. So this was just a, a great okay. resource for us to move our squash. And then, now you're, this is just a test. I mean, at this it point. It is, yeah. Um, yeah. So with, with um, Hex Market, we um, purchased those six outright because that's what we chose to be. We were willing to speculate on. Oh, okay. So Renaissance Farms said, we will speculate on these six pallets. Uh, squash, and so we purchase them from okay. Hex Market here. Okay. I would hope, you know, like it could be where, like, the speculation, like he's saying, that, you know, if this gets going, he can call us in March and say, you know what, next year mm -hmm. people are going to want this, then we'll evaluate what we're growing and say, you know, let's cut back here and grow five acres of squash for Mark. Mm -hmm. And then he can say, you know, I'm going to take all this. How do sales like this at the end of the season? getting ready to freeze. How do sales like this affect what you've got left over and the amount of product that you can actually sell? Well, like I said, it's, it was tremendous because we had 9, 10, 12 bins of squash sitting in our the back of our market. And, you know, other than sort it this week and sort it this week and sort it this week and you're down to maybe two bins because they, you keep losing them. It's, a, you know, just a fact of life. Now you're talking about losing them just with waste. Waste. Okay. You know, and, and Gary was outsourcing, you know, like I said, calling Potato King, calling Awesome. You know, every week he'd call and say, you need a bin? And, you know, I, I think you need a bin. And, no, I think we're full. 
Okay. So, you know, the call came and it was, you know. Okay, and... and it, it, it helps pay two or three bills that we, you know, ah. just, you know, it's, it's an income that okay. it'll, it'll pay the telephone bill and it'll pay the light bill because of that. So if you weren't selling this to Mark or, you know... You my lights it, would be shut off. Your lights would be shut <laughs> off. There's a whole new story here. <laughs> the banker would be knocking on my door. No, I mean, you know, it's just that extra, it was just a little boost, like, wow, you know, sure. we got an extra hundred dollars. Because, sure. you know, with our business, just as Dick's business, because to this time of the year, you have nothing. We're selling trees and wreaths and stuff, which we make our own. Um, get that in there, we make our own wreaths. Um, but come January, February, March, April, till you're back in production with something, you know, with the potatoes and the whatever, um, we have to save. You know, mm -hmm. you know, when the summer's good, it's not you're not out buying a new car, you're not out buying, you know, a boat or whatever. You're saving that because I know what it's going to take for January, February, March right. for the bills. So this was an extra little boost. Okay, mm -hmm. that'll you know, a little extra income padded in there, and mm -hmm. so. So when I sell the last cinnamon roll at the farmer's market, that's almost pure profit. Right. That's how I look at it. So exactly. the, the very last sales of anything are where the profit is. Oh, okay. And you know, as far as Mark calling us and saying he needed this, at that point, you know, you can sell a little cheaper because the labor's in it already. Right. You've got your time in it. And instead of sorting it how many more times, you say, okay, I can give Mark a fifty dollar bin cut. Yeah. Because now it's all profit. And it's yeah, because you're it's sitting there actually costing you money. Exactly. At, at a certain point. Right. Well, it's always costing you right. money. Right. You've got forward. your seed. You've got everything invested. Your labor and you you know your time. Right. Right. And now you have to go through it and pull right. out the bad ones. Right. So that's got to hurt. Right. And how many I mean, times you expensive. want to do that? Right. Um, anything else? Um, just you know, I don't know if you talked about being the GAP certified. We both, oh. we both oh, got GAP are? certified, Jess. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, we did it two years ago. Okay. Um, and we did it through the Valio company. He t had talked to Gary at one of the shows we went to and um, said that that's what it's going to get to, where Reinhardt and Cisco, nobody's going to buy from anybody that's not GAP certified. Okay. And so we figured if, if that's what it takes, you know, to get our product out there, that, you know, we'll do that. And it did, you know, cost us $25,000 because... We were at the point where we needed new equipment anyway, you know, like Mark buying new stuff. We needed a new washer. Our washer was getting old and <clears throat> added on, you know. But there was a few things. You have to have boxes separate from this and that. And mm -hmm. So we had to have a building for that. So we, you know, took the time, did the investment, and got GAP wow. certified. And it, that has opened up doors for us because that's one of the things, if Mark's selling some of the squash to certain stores or certain people, it has to be GAP certified. They will not buy Okay. It's why I bought squash first from Dick's. And are you looking, I mean, are you going exclusively with GAP certified? No, because I or? can't source that much yet. Not everybody's oh. as proactive right. as okay. him. But if, but if Reinhardt would come in and say, we'll buy it, but I need that GAP certification, that gets our foot in the door a little bit sure. with people. Sure. And right. that's what, with the, the lady up at Minnow Point, the Howden Center, you have to be GAP certified. So they bought pie pumpkins and stuff from us. I mean, for I could, them? Okay, for, for them, them to, to buy. To buy. Right. Oh, okay. Right. For them to buy from anybody okay. to use there, you have to be GAP certified. Okay. And so that got us in the door there. So they bought pumpkins from us, and and this next year she's you know she's looking at beans for dilly beans for people. Sure. Um, tomatoes, peppers, all that kind of stuff. Right. So, so Wonderful. that got our foot in that door. Wonderful. So we did a um, there was a grant pulled from Southwest Cap. Uh, two years ago, there was a series of workshops, and one of the people that came in was a GAP certifying expert. And Gary was at that um, that meeting, and to his credit, that spring he was certified. Wow! Um, so, uh, and then Mark got certified this fall. Right, this fall or this summer. Right. Okay. So, you know, in in the development of this mid-year processing infrastructure, you want to support those people that are taking a risk. Right. You know, it, they're out there, they're spending money to make it better, to, to step up to standards that aren't yet standards. These are voluntary standards. Hmm. Um, it's, it's, and and it's, in the long run, it will help all the farmers, all the 
um, farm market people if everybody has to be certified because when they had the big tomato scare three, four years ago, everybody had to dump your tomato and you can't buy it because you don't know where it came from. Now they'll be able to resource it back. If we sure. sold something to Mark and a squash went to a restaurant and somebody got sick, everybody doesn't have to dump their squash. They right. source it back to us. Okay. And then we see what tracking label, where, what, okay. you know, whatever went out. Nice. Right, so it makes sense. Right. But, but you have um, food safety plans and practices. You have log books that get filled out. You have blah, 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 blah. And, and these are done, you know. It's a matter well, of checking your cooler temperature every day. Um, did you wash your hands after you went to the bathroom and when you got to work? So, you know, these happen in, they're messy. They happen while we're in the wow. field. Wow. Yeah. It's a pain in the butt. Yeah. But you like filling out paperwork. I, that's really my specialty. That's really why you want it. That's why we farm, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can have somebody sitting there just doing paperwork. You know, farming has gotten to be paperwork now. Yeah. Anything else? Well, it's, it's, we're actually very fortunate in a small area between 12 miles to have four or five market people. So, but mm -hmm. farm market, it, it, in, this, in this context, it, it denotes the types of crops being grown. Oh, okay. Really, as opposed to just general field crops right. or dairy. Okay. And that's what's unusual. Yeah. I think the other thing is, is that um, this is a perfect example of a rural situation of creating what we need to move forward. Um, this is grassroots taking control of our economic situation, doing what we need to do, creating jobs by doing it, and we're not waiting. We're not sitting around whining. And the fact is, is that local food is a very easy multiplier of, do of jobs and dollars. So by supporting local foods, you are supporting job creation, you're supporting sure. wealth creation in rural communities. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect example of how to start that. Right. Sure. Well, we want to try to get into more, like I said, we want to do the, we grow the beans, we want to do dilly beans, sure. we want to do like a Absolutely. pickle relish, we want to do, so we want to get into a little more of that too. Yeah. So the other thing you're hearing here is that as we develop this infrastructure, more options are available. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't translate into jobs directly, but it translates into security and wealth creation. So there's intangibles that happen that are harder to measure. Sure. And that's a perfect example. Yeah, that's a good point. Two years ago, Thrive did a study, an economic study. Was, uh, had an economic study done. And in the year that they studied, farmers had a good year and it bumped the medium income of all Wisconsin citizens up. And I mm -hmm. find that amazing that's, because that's, wow. the number of farmers are minuscule percentage-wise. Yeah, I mean, what percentage of the workforce is farmers in Wisconsin? You know? Minuscule. And yet an increase in farm income bumped the whole medium average up for all of Wisconsin. Interesting. That said something to me. Yeah. The other thing that came out in that report was is that we send most of our raw agricultural products across state lines to be processed and then buy them back. Mm. So we're, we're, we're paying a premium for our products and getting nothing out of it. We're, there's no multiplier effect in it. So this mid-tier processing that is being created mm -hmm. um, in Wisconsin and in the upper Midwest and around the country, really, um, has the potential to start rectifying that and creating uh, wealth in rural areas. Sure. Which is Very efficiently. It seems. It seems really efficient. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's not a lot of transactions going on here. You're buying from the farmer. So here's another point, and, and this is where um, we need to update a law within the state of Wisconsin. Um, I buy from Dick Peck, Hex Market, and Hex Farm Market um, because they are markets. I can't buy from a farmer as a processor without being bonded. It's against the law. It's an old law, and one of my peers here in the valley who's growing, who's, in my opinion, the, the cream of the crop of the next farmer processors, happily checked on the back of his license that, yes, I buy from the farmers. You know, I'm proud of it. I'm going to check that three times. He got a call and fines and, yeah, 
was a fiasco. So that, that is a, um, a, a barrier at the legislative level that right. is in the way of this, which is old. And it, it hasn't raised its head yet, but as we start ramping this up, my hands are tied without, spend, without buying this insurance policy as to who I can buy from. Okay. So I can buy from the auctions, I can buy from farm markets. So you, okay, so you need to be bonded. If I'm going to buy directly from a farmer. Because, you know, earlier you said that this was uh, all done by private. That's only sort of true because a lot of these connections with the distributors are mm. able to happen because of what Dane County Planning has done. Mm. Okay? And mm -hmm. I was a huge skeptic when that first started. I thought that was a poor use of public money. Um, and I don't believe that. Okay. I, I believe that what they accomplish by bringing these people together for the two or three years that they've been doing it is truly helped create a market, facilitated the creation of a market in a shorter period of time than it would have taken. But you're talking about a, but you're talking about these 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 government organizations that are able to or departments that are able to put people together, but they're not necessarily supplying the primary cash. That these far, you know, they don't need anything. Uh, Hex doesn't need anything other than knowing that you're there to sell to you. Correct. You know, setting up the network. Correct. So they're not having to. It's a very efficient use of government. It appears to be. If they're not having to say, well, yeah, okay, we're going to loan you a hundred thousand dollars so you can get a taping machine. That would be a poor use of public. In my well, opinion, especially that, since you, you yeah. wouldn't leverage public funds as much as other things that they could do. Right. Right. There's a right. better way to say it. Not that it's right. poor or wrong. It's not poor, but it does... Um, How much does it leverage? Yeah, and it does protect them from, oh, well, I mean, you're taking a risk. Mm -hmm. That they're not. Right. You know, it's not going to cost, the, cost them whether, whether or not you right. succeed or not. That's appropriate. Yeah, That's that is appropriate. The difference between business and government. A year ago, Lois said, when we were sitting in the gym at Riverdale Point, if, you, if, a, if somebody wants, if a farmer wants to enter the value-added arena, they have that ability in southern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. There are no barriers with the Innovation Kitchen anymore. Hmm. You can get that done. Oh, yeah. That's huge. That's I mean, very that's, huge. And, and that kind of foundational statement and recognition um, was like an epiphany. Because, like, oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, we did it. And no, nobody's claimed success on it yet. I mean, that's the funny thing. And I think it's, I mean, I don't know what sort of effort has gone into convincing mm -hmm. farmers to use this. No. But it's they dollars. seem to be. It's been the appropriate, yeah. it's been the appropriate convincing. Yeah, naturally, product. naturally moving towards it. Yeah. I mean, you There's know. no need to entice anybody with a good idea. The theory behind the winter farmer's market when we were setting that up was that yeah. if, we, if we provide the venue, the farmers will step up to the plate and provide the products. And beyond any shadow of the WTF, mm -hmm. these events are a prime example of given the opportunity, right. they will step up and do what they need to do and not expect anybody else to do it.